Sanguinius is the primarch of the Ninth Legion of Astartes, the Blood Angels. Sanguinius is one of the most respected and revered primarchs in the Imperium. He is seen by ordinary citizens as one of humanity's symbols of beauty and power, in spite of, or perhaps because of, the Primarch's mutations that have given him enormous angelic wings. It is unclear whether these mutations are part of the Emperor's design, or the result of the Primarch travelling through the warp early in his life, or whether they are caused by the radiation-contaminated world of Baal, on which we know mutations were not unusual. But Sanguinius was gifted with more than just beauty and charisma. He was also one of the most formidable warriors in the Imperium. His skill was so great that even Lehman Russ, the proud and boastful Primarch of the Space Wolves, spoke of Sanguinius as the only Primarch he could not defeat one-on-one. -on -one. Also, during the Horus heresy, Sanguinius was proclaimed ruler of a state called Imperium Secundus, created by Primarch Robuta Gilliman in order to preserve as much of his father's empire as possible. Though Sanguinius reluctantly accepted the burden up to the fact of ruler of the new empire, he refused to accept the title of emperor and insisted on being referred to only as his father's regent. Eventually, Sanguinius and his legion found their way to Terra and took part in the defense of the Imperial Palace along with Jagatai Khan, Primarch of the White Scars Legion, Rogel Dawn, Primarch of the Imperial Fists. Sanguinius followed his father when he accepted Horus's challenge to storm the Vengeful Spirit, the flagship of the warrior fleet, to help the Emperor assassinate the Arch-Traitor. But the Imperial forces were separated by teleportation and materialized in different parts of the ship, causing Sanguinius to meet Horus before the others. The two Primarchs dueled, but Sanguinius was vastly inferior to the Chosen of the Dark Gods and was eventually killed. The Primarch's death caused a powerful wave of psychic energy and affected all the warriors of his legion. Since then, some of them have fallen into a berserk state on the battlefield and shouting battle cries and slogans from the time of the Horus Heresy have thrown themselves into furious attacks on the enemies of the Imperium. Over time, these symptoms worsened due to the fact that the psychic response produced a serious defect in the Blood Angel's family known as Black Rage. Since then, Sanguinius has been elevated to the rank of saint. Shrines in his honor began to spring up throughout the Imperium, just as temples dedicated to his father. In addition, the day the Primarch of the Blood Angels made his sacrifice is still celebrated in the Imperium as a holiday called Sanguinala, a day when people remember and pay homage to the exploits of the Great Angel. Sanguinius's body was evacuated from the vengeful spirit and taken to Baal, the planet on which the Primarch grew up and where he found his final resting place in the grand structure known as the Golden Sarcophagus. But will the great angel rest there forever or will the time come for his return one day? The most obvious way to resurrect the Primarch, yet one that the blood angels themselves are unlikely to allow, is to clone Sanguinius. And even more enraging to the warriors will be the fact that there is only one man in the entire galaxy who possesses not only the necessary knowledge, but also experience in cloning Primarchs. And that man is Fabius Bile. Fabius Bile is a senior apothecary of the traitorous Emperor's Children Legion, known for his inhumane experiments, his extensive knowledge of the Primarch's genome, and his expertise in creating perfect clones. Fabius created multiple incarnations of the Iron Hands Primarch Ferris Manus, who was later killed by the enraged demon Primarch Fulgrim. He also created a clone of Luna Wolves Primarch, Horus Lupercal, who was killed by Abaddon, and then a clone of Primarch Fulgrim, who was given to Necron Overlord Trazin the Infinite in exchange for samples of the pure and warp damage-free gene seed of the Emperor's children. Among other things, Fabius possesses samples of Sanguinius's blood, stolen in a daring operation on Bale itself from the artifact known as the Red Grail. Thanks to a duped apothecary, Bile was able to breed a new species of mutants on Baal, blood-devouring, distorted space marines of the Ninth Legion, susceptible to Black Rage, who stole Sanguinius' blood for him. And even when Blood Angel Sergeant Raphine, after a series of interesting events described in the novel Black Fury, finally caught up with one of Fabius's clones carrying samples of the Primarch's blood and fought him. It turned out that the Clone Lord had long ago analyzed the samples and no longer needed them. 
It's pathetic. Look at you, giving up your life for a few drops of liquid. It means a lot to you, doesn't it? And yet you cannot realize its full potential. Take it. Take it and pray to it for as long as your pathetic life will allow. But know this. Your precious Sanguinius will not save you, and neither will your quietly decaying Emperor. I've kept this relic merely for the collection, and I will be able to create more specimens once I leave this place. In fact, I don't even need them anymore. I have extracted all the data that the Primarch's blood could give me, and I don't need it anymore. It's useless. And despite the fact that Fabius's clone was killed shortly after these words, this did not prevent the Apothecary from obtaining the data he needed as Fabius had already shown his ability to quickly exchange information between his clones many times before. So despite the fact that Fabius organized this operation in order to obtain data that would help him clone the Emperor himself, the Apothecary is well positioned to create a clone of Sanguinius. The main problem with this, however, would be that clones of Primarchs retain their memories to some degree. Horus's clone, for example, recognized Abaddon the moment he saw him, leading the clone to die. Also, clones of Ferris Manus remembered certain events from the time of the Great Crusade and during a conversation with Fulgrim behaved extremely aggressively when the latter spoke of betrayal. Likewise, Sanguinius can behave extremely aggressively towards his creator, though Fabius is smart enough to foresee this and take appropriate action. Either way, a Sanguinius clone can have a strong emotional bond with Fabius Bile, such as the Fulgrim clone who perceived the Apothecary as his father, though this could be solely due to the fact that Bile himself is a carrier of the gene seed of the Primarch of the Emperor's children. One way or another, there is another being with the power to bring the Primarch of the Ninth Legion back to the world of the living. Not to create a copy of him, but to resurrect him. Ivrain, the emissary of the awakened god of the dead, has demonstrated her ability to resurrect the dead many times. She does not simply reanimate a dead body, but fully returns a living being to true life. This is described in more detail in the book The Fracture of Biltan, Lord of the Swarmin. Ivrain resurrects the Eldari Corsairs, Prince Iriel, after he was killed by the demon Prince Nurgle. Ivrain stabs Iriel's chest with the Spear of Twilight and revives him, making him stronger than ever. The spear turns out to be Vol's final fifth sword. In the same book, we see that Evrain's resurrection abilities are not limited to members of her race. Later, during a battle within the web against the Legion of a Thousand Sons, Evrain demonstrated her abilities to Azek Ariman. She was able to dispel the rubric of Ariman's curse with a small group of space marines, restoring their bodies and minds to what they were before Ariman created rubric in an attempt to save his legion from mutation. This sent the sorcerer himself into shock. But before he could come to his senses, all of the legionnaires who came back to life were killed. Either way, Ivrain's demonstration of her ability to resurrect both Elder and Astartes suggests that resurrecting the Primarch should be well within her capabilities. In addition, before Ivrain helped heal Ultramarine Primarch Raboot Gilliman, he was bound to his armor, created by Belisarius Call which serves as a life support system that allows the Primarch to live despite Fulgrim's wounds. So, assuming that Ivrain has decided to help the humans bring the Primarch of Ultramarines back to life in order to defeat the forces of Chaos, it is possible that she will also someday travel to Baal, the goal of resurrecting Sanguinius. But there's one important detail that could prevent Ivrain from doing so. A soul. When the Ivrain resurrected Iriel, his soul was inside a thing that every Eldar carries with them continuously, inside the Stone of Souls. Likewise, the golems of the rubric are not just magic armor. They are the souls of space marines, trapped inside their power armor, while Sanguinius's soul, or part of it, remained at the site of his death. Inside the Vengeful Spirit. In the novel The Talon of Horus, the remnants of the souls of the Loyalists who died during the assault on Horus's battle tower took the form of crystal statues. Iskandar Kaon, sorcerer of the Legion of a Thousand Sons, noted the following about these statues. I ran my glove fingers over one of the faces, almost expecting its eyes to open. There was life in these statues to one degree or another. Someone's grim presence lurked behind the closed eyes. They were like faint echoes of life. 
similar to those felt in the golems of the rubric, but different at the same time. After considering the crystal tongue and closed eyes, I realized why the feeling was so familiar. They were echoes of a soul that had left its body and was stuck in those frantic seconds before falling into the hands of the demons. These statues appearing on the ship were nothing more than shards of Sanguinius's own soul, which is described in the novel Black Legion. These statues appeared everywhere on the ship, and no matter how many were destroyed, they were constantly rebuilt, but not necessarily in the same place they were shattered. Some marines of the Black Legion saw these statues as a bad omen, while others barely paid any attention to them. But either way, these episodes indicate to us that a significant portion of Sanguinius's soul remained aboard the vengeful spirit. And quite possibly because of this, resurrecting the Primarch might be an impossible task. However, in the novel The Devastation of Baal, there is an episode where Dante was near death as a result of a battle with a tyrannid creature known as the Swarm Lord. Dante was visited by a vision in which he spoke to Sanguinius himself. The Primarch praised Dante for his service and dedication. Dante asked Sanguinius to ease his death, but the great angel replied that he would not allow Dante to die as long as the Imperium needed him. Could this mean that Sanguinius's soul is not bound entirely to the vengeful spirit? And could this vision of Dante be more than just a hallucination? Anyway, even if the Ivrain can't bring the great angel back to life, there's still one thing left that might be able to do it. The Proteus Protocol. This ancient heretical technology consists of transferring not only the engrammatic knowledge and memory of an organic brain, but also the personality and will of the user. This, in effect, allows a user to accomplish mental as well as spiritual immortality through an artificial physical form. The few legends that surround the Proteus Protocol state that the abominations created by it were soulless beings that seek dark desires and alien hungers that can never be satiated. Despite these warnings, many still seek to find examples of the Proteus Protocol in order to become immortal. A similar procedure was performed by Inquisitor Gregor Eisenhorn when he found a crystal containing the soul of the heretic Pontius Glor. Eisenhorn bargained the heretic's knowledge of warp demons and their vulnerabilities in exchange for a primitive mechanical body and senses. Though the Inquisitor warned that Pontius would never see freedom, even the faint hope of a return to the real world was too welcome for him, and he agreed without hesitation. Unfortunately, Magos Gerd Boer, a friend of Inquisitor Eisenhorn, for unknown reasons, created not just a mechanical body for Pontius, but a real work of art, moreover, practically invulnerable in battle and possessing a wide arsenal of deadly weapons. Perhaps Pontius somehow tricked the tech priests, but ended up getting what he wanted and then killed Boer and left his dungeon. Sanguinius could similarly be resurrected by placing his consciousness into an artificial body specially created for him, but it would be an outrageous act of heresy to use technology forbidden by the Emperor to revive his own son. It is also unclear what will happen to the Blood Angels subject to the Dark Fury when their Primarch returns. Jagatai Khan, also known as the Warhawk, was one of the 20 Primarchs created by the Emperor to reclaim the galaxy in the Great Crusade. He, like the rest of the Primarchs, was carried away from terror and marooned on a distant world. Jagatai's capsule ended up on the wild world of Mundus Planus, or, as the native population called it, Chogoris. It was a planet where nomadic tribes were in a constant state of war with their neighbors for the resources and land needed to survive. The Khan of one of these tribes found the young Primarch and took him into his family, raising him as his own son. After the death of his adoptive father, Jagatai Khan led the tribe and started a war. Not out of bloodlust and senseless cruelty, but to unite the world. Thus began an entire era for the Chagoris, which became a legend millennia later. Jagatai began to be called the Great Khan. Khan's power stretched from ocean to ocean. The greatest empire the planet has ever known was created by a single man in less than 20 years. Though Jagatai Khan ruled over a vast area, he knew that his men had no desire to rule such a kingdom. 
His new empire grew from his conviction to unite the tribes and exact vengeance on his enemies, but not from any desire to take possession of their lands. Ultimate power lay with the Khan and his generals. Although they were well organized militarily, the tribes had no ability to govern the settlements. It is also known that Jagatai Khan completed the reunification of his empire just six months before the emperor reached Chogoris. It is said that when these two great warriors met, the Khan knew that when he met the one who embodied the final ideal he had fought for, the man who could unite all the stars in the sky, in the palace in front of all his generals, Jagatai fell on one knee and swore eternal loyalty to the Emperor. The Primarch was given command of the Fifth Legion, who called themselves White Scars. The great Khan ascended to the heavens with the Emperor, transferring the title of Khan of his people to Khan Ogedai. Many of Jagatai's followers decided to join their Khan and became Space Marines of the White Scars. The Legion's base was built on Chogoris. The White Scars Legion truly became famous during the Horus Heresy. Unlike some of the other Primarchs, Jagatai Khan never thought of betraying the Emperor. He could not compromise his honor and break his oath to serve the Imperium. But when Horus began his rebellion, the Primarch of the White Scars and his legion were hunting orcs in the Chondak system. At that time, Lehman Rus was tricked into siding with Magnus the Red and his Thousand Sons. And it was the Primarch of the Space Wolves who was accused of treason. Horus, as Commander-in-Chief, ordered Jagatai Khan to crush Rus's rebellion. At that time, the Primarch of the Fifth Legion received a message from Rogel Dorn, who was gathering forces to defend Terra. The White Scars traveled to Prospero to sort out where is the truth and where is the lie. There they met Lehman Russ fighting the Alpha Legion. Despite the fact that the Space Wolves needed help, Rogel Dorn ordered Khan to go to Terra and Russ to lead the Alpha Legion fleet away. The White Scars were known to be defending the Imperial Palace in conjunction with the Blood Angels and Imperial Fists. Khan's warriors killed quite a few Chaos Space Marines and conducted several successful raids hunting down retreating traitors. When Horus was defeated by the Emperor, Jagatai continued to persecute the traitors. Seven years after the heresy ended, during the Reformation started by Raboot Gilliman, the Khan adopted the Codex Astartes. The White Scars allowed themselves to be divided into several orders. Jagatai Khan and his order returned to Chogoris on a mission to protect it. There, the Primarch learned that during his absence, the world had suffered several attacks by the Dark Eldar, kidnapping thousands of inhabitants. Once again, the Khan set out to avenge his tribe. For seventy years, he hunted the Dark Eldar until in the year 84 of the 31st millennium, he went missing. His fate is unknown, but what could have happened to him next? Well, the circumstances of the Primarch's disappearance are themselves a topic for debate. According to the most common version, Jagatai Khan went missing in pursuit of a certain Eldar warlord. Supposedly, this was the Dark Father himself, the head of the Incubus, the Primarch set out to chase him into the web, and given that he hadn't returned in the last 10,000 years, he could well be considered dead. For while Jagatai Khan, like all Primarchs, was a consummate warrior, he remains a mortal being and may well have fallen before the hordes of Dark Eldar within the web. And this would not be an unprecedented case, for Rogel Dorn died in a similar manner, fighting the Marines of the Traitor Legions, repelling one of the early Black Crusades. However, we have circumstantial evidence that Jagatai Khan is actually alive. In the novel Ashes of Prospero, Njal Stormcaller, the mightiest rune priest of the Space Wolves, was interpreting a vision of Logan Grimnar while trying to understand the whereabouts of their missing Primarch Lehman Russ. Even my gaze found it difficult to break through the excitement of the warp. Still, I could see the sleeper buried in the rock and White Storm rushing in on a lightning chariot. Darkness rises to the messengers of the Father, a darkness that strikes from within. Sleeping buried in the rock is an obvious allusion to Leo L. Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels, who slumbers in the heart of the rock, the Dark Angels' fortress, built from a splintered piece of their homeworld of Caliban. 
and the words about White Storm on the Lightning Chariot clearly refer us to the White Scars as they wear white armour and use lightning as their sigil. In addition, we cannot rule out the possibility that the Primarch was captured by the Dark Elder and is now in Komora, a Dark Elder city that lies within the web. Komora is known for its countless coliseums and fighting arenas belonging to the witch cults of the Dark Eldar. In these arenas, they practice their fighting skills on various creatures captured during raids. These could be Imperial Guard soldiers, orcs and even space marines, or monstrous tyrannid creatures like Carnifex or Hive Tyrant. And it was entirely possible that one of the legendary monks might well have interested the Dark Elder as such a fighter. But if Jagatai Khan has indeed become a slave in Komora, one wonders why he has not attempted to escape in all this time, and why the Imperial forces are not taking any action to free him. Well, in the 35th millennium, thanks to the machinations of Asdrubale Vect, the Salamanders, Howling Griffins and Silver Skulls attacked the Komora in order to rescue their brothers in the Order of Salamanders and were trapped by the Dark Eldar. This struck force of Astartes wiped out a huge number of Drukhari, allowing Vec to subsequently take control of the Komora. This shows that the Komora could very well fall to Imperial forces as much as it could resist them. And what could have prevented the Primarch of the White Scars from taking advantage of the confusion and escaping from the fighting pits and making his way to the Astartes afterward? For Jagatai Khan, it shouldn't have been an impossible task. Perhaps the Primarch didn't need to flee Komora at all. What if he had long ago fled to Sarin? Or maybe he had never been captured at all, and was now hiding in the dark streets of Komora, striking at the Xenos when he saw fit. Additionally, the fact that Jagatai Khan is missing in the web does not mean that he is now in Komora at all. He may well be fighting inside the web, cleansing it of demonic presence. During the Horus Heresy, which is described in more detail in the book The Path of Heaven, the White Scars fleet was pursued on its way to Terra by Death Guard's ships led by Primarch Mortarion and several ships of the Emperor's children under the command of Eidolon. Before finding a safe path to the capital world of Terra, the White Scars came across a space station and the Dark Glass Throne, very similar to the Golden Throne of Terra. One of the Stormseers used it, and through the pain the throne caused him, he saw the web and its multiple damage, as well as the hordes of demons. It was Magnus who opened the way for them. Before the throne finally consumed the seers, he managed to relay a message of a safe passage to terror through the web. Even there, however, the White Scar's fleet was attacked by Slanesh demons. Jagatai Khan fought the Keeper of Secrets, and despite his wounds in that battle, the Primarch banished the demon back to the warp with the following words. There is nowhere for you to hide now. We know who you are, and we will pursue you on every level of reality. First we will clear the void, and then we will clear the warp. It is possible that after the pursuit of the Dark Eldar, Jagatai Khan, realizing where he was, remembered the Stormseer's warning about the demonic creatures that dwell in the web. And now the Primarch, along with his First Brotherhood, fights within this dimensional transportation system, cleansing it of any demon or xenos that they encounter along the way. It's quite possible that he was instigated to do so by Eldred Ulthran himself, pursuing his own interests by aiding the Imperium in its war against pernicious forces, as he has done with three Primarchs before. Ferus Manus, Fulgrim and Vulcan. But while Ferris ignored all visions and Fulgrim was seduced by chaos, Vulcan heeded the seer's warning. This is detailed in the Old Earth, where Eldred received a vision of events taking place in the distant future, where the gates to the web on Terra opened again, and hordes of demons broke through into reality, ravaging Terra. Eldred could have told Jagatai of his vision, and the Primarch is still traveling the web, destroying any threat that could break straight out to Terra. But despite all the previous arguments, Jagatai Khan could indeed have gotten lost in the warp with his ship, as indicated by the Index Astartes. Although the Codex does say that it was in the web that the Primarch was lost. The words of Njal Stormcaller also suggest that the Primarch was lost in the warp. 
After all, nothing else resembles a chariot of lightning as much as Jagatai Khan's ship. Besides, in that case, it could have only been a couple days or weeks for Jagatai Khan. Whereas in the real world, 10,000 years had already passed. That would go a long way toward explaining the Primarch's disappearance without a trace. Although in this case, his return would cause some inconvenience, for example, to reboot Gilliman. Conrad Kurz, also infamously known as the Night Haunter, is the Primarch of the Eighth Legion of Astartes, the Night Lords. Of all the Primarchs, Kurz may have been the most brutal, a ruthless sadist plagued by mental illness. Despite his keen sense of justice, Kurz grew up on a crime-ridden world, sheltered by eternal night and known as Nostramo, where Kurz administered his justice using terror and brutality, mercilessly punishing any crime, no matter how grave. And proportionately as the number of known criminals killed by the young Primarch grew, so did the crime rate on the planet. Until the citizens of Nostramo began to follow the law without exception, fearing that the Night Hunter would come after them. Thanks to the actions of the young Primarch, peace and tranquility finally came to the streets of Nostramo cities for the first time in years. During the Horus heresy, Kurz sided with the traitor Horus Lupercal and took part in the massacre on Istvan V. After their defeat at the Battle of Terror, the Night Lords did not flee like all the other legions of traitors. They continued to fight the Imperium, but their tactics reeked of self-destruction and utter despair. Kurz began to lose the sanity for which he was mostly respected, and in recent days fell into absolute madness, leaving his mind a decaying corrupted body bursting with sadism, inconsistency and anger. Kurz was killed by an assassin named Mushen. It is said that he allowed her to arrive at the palace on Sagwalsa, as she did not encounter any guards on her way to the throne room. Kurz believed that his death would atone for all that he had once said and done, and save him from more madness. At the very moment Mushen reached her destination, he spoke his famous last words. This arrival is not a surprise to me, assassin. I knew your ship had arrived at the eastern edge. Why did I not believe to execute you? So, from the fact that your mission, and what you are about to do, only proves that I did everything right. Think your emperor wants to finish me off. It's nothing compared to retribution. Now do your job and be done with it. After the Primarch's death, Apothecary Talos Valkyran, in defiance of Conrad Kurz's last orders, set out in pursuit of the assassin, determined to kill her to avenge the death of his genetic father. Other Legion warriors also joined the pursuit, but not for revenge, but to recover the Legion's new relic, the severed head of the Primarch, which Mushen had taken with her as proof of her successful assassination. But since Conrad Kurz has been beheaded, does that mean he can never return, right? Not necessarily. In general, the Primarchs have a lot in common with each other, and in some ways they are more or less similar. Conrad Kurz was known for his ability to make predictions, which, albeit to a lesser extent, was also common to Sanguinius, for example, or Vulcan, for example. The Primarch of the Salamanders had outstanding regeneration abilities, which Fulgrim also demonstrated. In one episode of the story Split Reflection, when the foot of the Primarch here and the Emperor was literally melted along with his ankle, only to fully regenerate a few minutes later. Does this mean that Conrad Kurz has even the slightest chance of regenerating after being decapitated? It seems completely unbelievable as even Primarch Ferris Manus found himself unable to regenerate after such a thing. But somehow there is one thing to consider, and that is the crown of Conrad Kurz. It is known that the crown was on the Primarch's head when Mushen came to take his life, and it is possible that this artifact could be the key to the Primarch's rebirth. This conclusion follows from the description of the crown itself, which was presented in the book Lord of the Night, when Claw Master Zhou Sahal finally found the artifact. A simple and smooth circle of icy metal glittered with incredible power. On all sides of the hoop, thin, jagged spikes pointed upward, blackening at the edges like saber blades dipped in oil. But the most stunning thing about the crown was the enormous gemstone that was to sparkle on the wearer's forehead, a beautiful ruby teardrop sparkling with the purest facets not mined from 
the bowels of the earth, but as if grown in the crystal garden of the gods, and despite the gloomy lighting of the gallery and the huge shadow of Sahal falling on it, it glittered, shining with inner light, burning with flame across the visible spectrum, dazzling the lord of the night, even if he averted his gaze. And the fact that a psyker named Mita Ashin could feel the very drop in the center of the crown may hint that this drop is actually a soul stone. Soul stones are magical items used by Eldar from artificial worlds as a sort of soul catcher that protects the Elder's soul from the dangers of the warp after death. And the moment the stone places an Elder's soul inside it, it turns a bright orange or red color. Then you might ask, could it be that Conrad Kurz killed an elder warrior and adorned his soul stone with his crown? Well, that was most definitely not the case. When Mita Ashen got close to the crown, which was then in the personal collection of the governor, she felt the presence of a night lord. At first mistaking it for the presence of the crown itself, she felt the presence of Sahal, the only night lord's marine on the planet at the time. And when Ashin turned her gaze back to the case that held the crown, she felt something that could be mistaken for the Night Hunter's soul. This is the cargo, Mita realized. It was the one that had been stolen from the traitor space marine. And the ocean of sensation burning beneath the lid was so identical to the Lord of the Night that it could fool even a psyker. Now she could see the tiny differences, the ugly mismatches that told her it was something else entirely her enemy's greatest jewel before her, a mysterious something that burned Mita's astral senses. Which brings us to the possibility of Kurz's resurrection, namely an exchange of souls with whomever the crown chooses. This may seem like an unlikely option at first glance, but this sort of thing has happened somewhere before. In a book called Path of the Seer, the Seer Elder of the world of Ulthwe managed to accomplish just such an action. At the beginning of the story, Auric bound the Soul Stone to the psychically sensitive free trader Janus Dark, under the pretense that it would protect the free trader, who at the time was wanted by a demon prince of Slanesh. On the planet Belial IV, Ulthwe fought a demon and lost, but the stone bound to the free trader kept his soul from being consumed by the demon prince. Later, Janus himself also fought the demon and was victorious. Once the Demon Prince's defeat was finally apparent, Ulthwe took full control of the Free Trader's body, swapping souls before Janus's sword sent the demon into warp. After the battle, he returned the body to Janus because it was not suitable for him, as the Eldar were accustomed to a different level of comfort. Ulthwe moved slowly. He felt very different. His clumsy body was too rigid, the balance shifted, his center of gravity was out of place. His senses were dulled and his reflexes were too slow. And worst of all, it was already starting to affect his thinking. He could literally feel his mind losing its former sharpness and the strange chemicals produced by his new glands were affecting his moods. Thanks to this book, it is conceivable that Conrad Kurz may have decided to take over the body of one of his sons, the Primarch was a powerful psyker and displayed outstanding abilities of telekinesis and divination, and this was by no means the limit of his abilities. As we know, the crown is currently in the hands of Zhou Sahal, who was rejected by his own brothers. And who knows, perhaps Master Kurz will one day return to his legion, or the Primarch will return to his children in his guise. In the final hours of the most devastating civil war in human history, the Emperor faced off against the strongest of his sons, Horus Lupercal, aboard the Vengeful Spirit. Despite his recent battle with Sanguinius, Primarch of the Blood Angels, Horus, thanks to the influence of the Dark Gods, was not only strong enough to stand up to his father, but increasingly confident in defeating him. After tearing out the Emperor's eye, ripping off his arm and breaking his spine, Horus brought the Lord of Mankind to his knees. But before the Arch Vigilante could finish the duel by taking the life of his own father, one of the custodians that had participated in the Vengeful Spirit's assault appeared on the bridge. Despite Horus's obvious superiority, the Emperor's Guardian pounced on the Primarch to do his duty and protect the Lord of Mankind. However, Horus, not dignifying the custodian with even a second of his attention, simply killed the brave man using the power given to him by the Dark Gods. 
It was this moment that allowed the Allfather to finally realize that the Horus he knew was dead, and now the warrior was nothing more than a mad monster, a puppet in the hands of Chaos. And the Emperor attacked his son with his pure psychic power, forcing the Dark Gods to retreat from the body of the Primarch, then struck again, destroying the very essence of Horus, his soul. And it is quite possible that a thousand shards of the Primarch's soul still exist today, even though the bulk of it was simply wiped from the face of the universe. And despite the fact that Fabius Bile, the chief apothecary of the Legion of the Emperor's Children, still managed to create a full-fledged clone of the warrior, we will not consider him specifically, but will focus on the original. When Horus first passed through the gates of Chaos on the planet Molek, he had been following many orders and commands from the Dark Gods for millennia, before finally returning to the real world, where only moments had passed. And despite the fact that the warrior had faithfully carried out all the orders of the pernicious forces, it would be naive to believe that he could keep his soul and return to the real world as he was. During the pursuit of the Sons of Horus by the Space Wolves, which was described in the book Wolf's Punishment, the warrior was mortally wounded by his brother, Lehman Russ, and left to die on the Bridge of the Vengeful Spirit. The Primarch's advisor, Malaghurst the Twisted, used his sorcery in an attempt to pull Horus from the embrace of death. And now a little bit of information about Malaghurst. Malaghurst the Twisted is a captain of the Lunar Wolves Legion, aid and advisor to Horus Lupercal. A veteran of the Legion from the start, having served the Legion of Lunar Wolves and the Sons of Horus in countless campaigns of the Great Crusade, Malaghurst earned the nickname The Twisted for the extraordinary intelligence he used to fulfill his role as Primarch's advisor. The nickname took on a cruel second meaning when, during the pacification of 63, 19, Malaghurst's transport was hit and he was severely wounded. Malaghurst survived but was left crippled and forced to leave the battlefield for good. However, he was able to devote himself entirely to the service of his lord. While faithfully serving the warrior, Malaghurst shared in his betrayal. By the time of his betrayal on Istvan III, Malaghurst was one of the warrior's closest advisors as well as the bearer of his iron-clad icon of the eye. As a result of the ritual, the spirit of Malaghurst travelled to the very dimension of chaos. There he met a demon guide named Amarok and found the warrior in the realm of Khorn. While the Primarch himself fought off endless waves of enemies gathered from across time and space, ranging from cavemen to Necron warriors and even to Hive Tyrant of the then unknown galaxy of Tyranid. When Malachurst finally made his way to the Primarch, the latter became furious. Convinced that the Counselor had disobeyed orders and followed him through the gate on Molek. Malachurst tried to convince the Primarch that this was just a trick of the warp, but Amarok intervened, explaining to the Counselor that it was not a trick at all. And this particular Horus had not left the realm of pernicious forces and was still on a mission for the Dark Gods, who had kept this part of his soul for themselves. He didn't come back, at least not completely. Horus has remained here in the edge of the carnage. If we go further, we will see him wandering among the gardens of Nurgle, catching the edge of his reflection. He will be trying to get out of the maze of mirrors. He has returned to himself, but a part of him, a part of his soul, of his power remains here, forever captured by the Dark Gods. This means that the shards may well still remain in the realm of chaos, but this leads us to some questions. For example, can such a shard become a demon prince? Can it be placed in a mortal body to create a new Primarch? And if these shards weren't wiped out when the Emperor killed Horus, could the Chaos Gods later create their own demonic version of the warrior? Either way, this demonic Horus might turn out to be rather weak compared to the other demon princes. The fact that the Dark Gods only possess a portion of Horus's soul could seriously affect the power of whatever demonic entity is created from it. Be that as it may, the mere fact that the Chaos Gods would decide to recreate Horus as a demon prince is in itself very unlikely. Horus is very often mentioned as something that was created solely to be sacrificed, like a lamb bred and fattened for slaughter. Two such references occur in the book, The Talon of Horus. The first time it was uttered by a certain demonic entity. 
When mentioning the possibility of resurrecting Horus to lead the legions and traitors again, a prospect not very satisfying to many leaders of traitors and demons, for the second time in the book such a thought was expressed by none other than Abaddon, the first captain of the now defunct legion of the Sons of Horus. When the future Ravager spoke with the Sorcerer of the Thousand Sons, Iskandar Kaon. Horus, have you heard the unborn speak of him? They give my father a name not by his victories, but by his failures, calling him the Sacrificed King. The fact that the Chaos Gods were preparing Horus solely to fail came as a surprise to the powerful Xenos organization called the Cabal. And it shows that the Dark Gods are slowly but surely increasing their influence over the material universe. Although the Cabal was able to foresee the events of Horus's heresy, they considered only two possible outcomes. If Horus won the war, it would mean neutralizing the influence of chaos in the material universe, albeit at the cost of the existence of the human race. If the Emperor had won, it would have led, on the contrary, to the strengthening of chaos. For the Imperium would have inevitably fallen into stagnation until chaos had consumed the entire galaxy. Thus Horus inevitably had to lose, but in such a way as to take the main enemy of the pernicious forces, the Emperor, out of the confrontation, while still maintaining his influence over the Imperium. Thus, if the shards of Horus's soul are still locked away in the realm of chaos, the only reason the gods keep them is for their own amusement. But what if someone or something could use those shards to create a new entity? or place them in a mortal body. When the Space Wolves attacked Prospero, the homeworld of the Legion of a Thousand Suns, Lehman Russ and Magnus the Red faced off in a duel that resulted in the physical body of the Primarch of the Thousand Suns being destroyed and his soul being shattered as well. Azek Ahriman retained most of these shards, but one of them was placed by Malkador Sigilite, into the body of the remaining Loyalist Sergeant of the Thousand Sons, thus giving birth to an entirely new personality, Janus, the first Supreme Grandmaster of the Grey Knights. Now, a little background on Revuel Arvida. Revuel Arvida is a Sergeant of the Fourth Brotherhood of the Legion of a Thousand Sons, a member of the Corvidae cult, and a veteran of the Great Crusade. During the Horus Heresy, he remained on the Loyalist side, Revuel was in the squad that was led to the surface of the devastated Prospero by Captain Colliston of the Fourth Brotherhood to search for any sign of survivors or the Primarch. It was six solar months since the tragic events on the Legion's homeworld. Imperial forces had ravaged Prospero after Primarch Magnus violated the Nikaia Edict, banning the dark arts of sorcery. Hoping to find any sign of the missing legion, instead, the Thousand Suns squad came under surprise attack by a much larger force of traitors, the World Eaters, who were on Prospero for their own reasons. In the ensuing battles, most of the Thousand Suns squad was killed and their captain captured. Using his innate powers of foresight, Sergeant Arvida was able to escape the trap, elude the traitors, and eventually escape the surface of the dead world. He would later find his way to Terra during the Heresy, where he would be transformed through a secret ritual conducted by Malkador Sigilite into a fusion of Arvida's personality and a psychic fragment of the personality of Primarch Magnus the Red, who remained on Throne World after his ritual invasion of the Imperial section of the Web to warn the Emperor of Horus's treachery. The new hybrid, later to become known as Janus, would become the first Supreme Grandmaster of the Grey Knights. If Magnus's Soul Shards can spawn a new entity, why can't Horus's Soul Shard do the same? The result might well be a being that challenges Abaddon the Destroyer to prove that it is the only one who deserves to bear the title of warrior. And there are those in the galaxy who would gladly conduct such an experiment for their own purposes, or simply for the sake of scientific curiosity. Rogel Dawn, also known as the Guardian of Terror, Prime mark of the Seventh Legion of Astartes' Imperial Fists. Dawn has been described as unyielding, humorless, yet steadfast and blindly loyal to the Emperor and the Imperium. During the Horus Heresy, the Primarch was given the title of Warrior in place of Arch Traitor, and tasked with strengthening Terra's defences and preparing it for the inevitable assault from the traitors. Dawn, among other things, was also a member of the Council of Terra 
where Malkador Sigilite, Regent of Terror, Constantin Valdor, Captain General of Legio Custodes, and Genetia Kroll, Knight Commander of the Sisters of Silence, also sat. And now a bit of information about Genetia Kroll. Genetia Kroll, Knight Commander of the Sisters of Silence, Doom of the Witches, Soulless Queen. One of the most enigmatic and dangerous commanders of the Imperium, Genetia Kroll, or as the chroniclers called her, the Soulless Queen, was the formidable Knight Commander of the Sisters of Silence. The best commander in her order, Genetia walked the shadows of the Great Crusade on behalf of her Imperial Lord. She commanded entire armies of Sisters of Silence on the few gruesome occasions when they were needed on the battlefield, hunted down and defeated psychers who had become godlike, cut short the lives of those who tried to withhold or openly defy the Great Tithe, and brought bloody retribution down upon the heads of those who killed any of her sisters. Assassin, general, avenger, and soul-chilling terror, Genetia Kroll became a creature of dark legend long before she was part of the Honor Guard tasked with delivering the Primarch Magnus as well as destroying Prospero. On the battlefield of Tizka, Kroll personally divided her marines into protective squads for the surviving accusatory host, allowing the Legion of the Thousand Sons to be nearly exterminated at the cost of the sacrifice of the Thousand Sisters, while she herself hunted down and killed many of the famed sorcerers of the Thousand Sons in combat. Toward the end of the battle, she became a ghostly figure from ancient myths, covered in white dust from crumbled marble and watered with the blood of many people. During the Siege of Terror, Rogel Dawn led the defense of the Imperial Palace, fighting alongside Jagatai Khan, Primarch of the White Scars, and Sanguinius, Primarch of the Blood Angels. Later, following the Emperor during the assault of the Vengeful Spirit, the flagship of the fleet scattered while teleporting around the ship. As a result, Dawn reached the bridge as the duel between the Emperor and Horus had already come to an end. The Primarch of the Imperial Fists returned the dying Lord of Mankind to Terra, where he was hooked up to a life support system called the Golden Throne. Dawn then led the Imperial forces in pursuit of the retreating legions of traitors. When the legions of loyalist Astartes were fragmented into orders, Rogel Dawn engaged in his last known battle, defending the Imperium against the Black Crusade. Once again, Dawn led a boarding party to an enemy flagship and disappeared, fighting off hordes of traitorous space marines. His fate is unknown and all that's left of him is a severed arm, which the Imperial Fist's marines managed to save and are currently keeping as a relic. So what really happened to Dawn? At first glance, it might seem that the Primarch actually died in battle. For despite the fact that Rogaldorn is clearly superior to the typical Astartes in general in everything, even he could possibly have been stopped by so many. In the book Space Marine by Ian Watson, there is mention of an entire skeleton of the Primarch in the possession of the Imperial Fists. Directly opposite was an inner chapel dedicated to Rogaldorn, made of blocks of compressed greenish-yellow amber separated by some bands. It housed the holiest relic of the fists, the mighty skeleton of the Primarch himself, sent in transparent amber along the contours of a human body. But this information should not be taken as truth, as Space Marine is one of many stories that have been recognized as non-canon. But the very idea that the Primarch is dead is also supported by the book Death Watch, Rite of Battles, which described the last moments of Dawn's life during the storming of the ship. The Primarch died in battle against the forces of chaos, repelling the Black Crusade, periodic and devastating invasions undertaken by legions of traitors from their hellish worlds of refuge in the Eye of Terror. Dawn and three companies of Imperial Fists conducted a series of skillfully executed boardings of Crusade ships. They destroyed engines and life support systems, as well as capturing entire gun batteries and turning them against other Chaos vessels. However, at the end of the marriage circled Dawn and his warriors when he attacked the command bridge of a Chaos flagship. None survived to tell the heroic tale of the Primarch's final battles. The Order's main bibliography found the Primarch's body on the bridge 
which was horrifyingly reminiscent of how Dawn discovered the wounded Emperor and carried him out before the flagship disappeared into the hellish depths of the Eye of Terror. The problem with both of these passages is that information from them contradicts more authoritative sources. The 8th edition of the Space Marines Codex clearly states that the Fists were only able to save the Primarch's severed arm, giving us reason to doubt the death of the Guardian of Terror. It is entirely possible that Rogel Dawn is still alive. This is partially confirmed by the book The Hunt for Vulcan. During the war with the Beast, the Salamander Primarch Vulcan that left his legion was rediscovered by Imperial forces fighting against the Orcs on the surface of Caldera. Eventually, Lord Commander Kurland of the Imperial Fists led a group to evacuate Primarch Salamanders as he could aid the Imperials in their confrontation with the Orcs. And before engaging the Orcs, Vulcan said the following to the Fist Commander. Fight fiercely, son of Dorn. Your actions glorify the Primarch's name, and I will tell him so. And even though Kurland himself did not specify what Vulcan's words meant, this moment indicates that Dawn is still alive. After all, it was Dawn who began the persecution of the traitors after Horus's heresy. It's entirely possible that Dawn survived that suicidal assault on the ship, and is still leading his campaign, vowing to kill every traitorous space marines he meets along the way. And the fact that Vulcan explicitly states his intentions to tell Dawn about Kurland's actions clearly indicates that he knew or knows where the Primarch of the Imperial Fists is now. And it is entirely possible that the Primarch would have left his sons on a mission unknown to us. For example, Dawn may have been recalled to terror to guard what is left of the Emperor. We do know that Dawn felt guilt towards his father for not having time to help him in his duel with Horus and holds himself responsible for his mortal wounds. It makes sense that Dawn would choose to fulfill his duty to his father and stand by his side in the throne room. For over 10,000 years, while our enemies both external and internal have been defeated, the Imperium has grown stronger and raised its head higher and higher. Those who wished us to fall have lost time and time again and will not know the joy of victory as long as we, the Emperor's chosen sons, do our duty. Only by defending humanity will we find our place in history for the Emperor. The fact that Dawn clearly uttered the phrase over 10,000 years suggests that Dawn is not only still alive but in Imperial service. But could Dawn have said those words before his disappearance? It is highly unlikely. If we take the beginning of the Unification Wars on Terror as the starting point of the Primarch speech, then Dawn must have said those words somewhere around the 39th millennium since the Emperor began creating the Imperium in the 29th. Ultimately, all these contradictions between sources and the fact that, according to current canon, no one has found the body of the Primarch don't add up to clarity, especially when you consider something else. And if Rogel Dawn is still alive, and if he is in the throne room, why has Robuta Gilliman, having returned to Terra, not reacted to this fact in any way? The return of Robuta Gilliman was hailed by the Imperium and the High Lords of Terra as an unprecedented, galaxy-turning case of the Emperor's son returning to help humanity in its darkest hours. And if Dawn was indeed alive and on Terra, Shouldn't he have met his brother, or at least led the defense of the palace against the demonic legions of Khorne? Anyway, even if Dawn hasn't been on terror all these years, the above gives us hope that one day the Primarch of the Imperial Fists will return to help humanity in an endless war against all possible and impossible horrors of the dystopian darkness of the distant future. Corvus Corax one of twenty Primarchs created by the Emperor at the dawn of the Imperium, just after the end of the Age of Discord. He, like the rest of the Primarchs, was swept away from terror and marooned on a distant world. Lysias was a satellite and raw material appendage of the planet Kyavar, ruthlessly ruled by tech guilds that drove most of the population into slavery. Hard labor and decay were the only things that awaited the opponents of the tyrannical regime. Among them, the doomed people, was Primarch Korax. The slaves raised him, they trained him in guerrilla warfare, and instilled in him a sense of justice and nobility. When the training was over, Korax led them and threw off the shackles of Kiavar. The moon of the Lucaeus was renamed Liberation 
in honor of her rescue by Korax. At the same time, the Emperor arrived on liberation. Korax accepted his father and agreed to lead his legion in exchange for bringing order to Kiavar. As a result, the base of the legion became liberation, and the tech priests of Adeptus Mechanicus arrived on Kiavar, restoring the factories of the industrialized world. During the Great Crusade, Korax proved himself a consummate expert in sabotage, guerrilla operations, and raids behind enemy lines. During the Horus Heresy, Raven Guard forces were among the Loyalist forces that landed on Istvan V and were trapped by the rebels. Most of the Raven Guard was destroyed in a treacherous attack in the landing zone. Before Istvan V, the Legion numbered about 80,000 Astartes. Only a few thousand managed to escape. Korax himself was badly wounded, but the surviving Space Marines were able to hide on the planet until they were picked up by the Legion fleet. Since the Raven Guard had been almost completely wiped out during the events of Heresy, Korax decided to use genetic engineering to speed up the creation of Space Marines. After the defeat on Istvan V, Korax travelled to Terra to meet with the Emperor. Despite his busy schedule, the Emperor contacted Korax and gave him some of the secrets to creating the Primarchs needed to quickly replace the losses suffered by the Legions, as well as the equipment to do so. At first, Korax's research went well. In a fairly short time, several hundred new Space Marines were created, who were not only as good as the remaining veterans, but surpassed them in reaction speed and tactical thinking. But Korax's plans for a quick revival of the Legion were not destined to come to fruition. Alpha Legion agents, infiltrating their ranks, knew of the research Korax was conducting and decided to steal the technology. After the Alpha Legionnaires were exposed and a battle ensued, most of the agents were destroyed. But the survivors were able to steal the Legion technology from Starthos and corrupt the Raven Guard's existing templates for creating new Space Marines. The gene code changes were revealed during the creation of the second group of Space Marines. Virtually all of the recruits were affected by the mutations, to the point where they lost their human appearance. When the Astartes Code was adopted, Korax obeyed it. He abandoned his experiments, destroyed the fruits of his experiments, and secluded himself in the Legion's fortress for a year and a day, grieving deeply for what he had condemned his genetic sons to. Leaving the fortress, he flew off in the direction of the Eye of Terror, leaving a brief message, never again. And what might have happened to him in the future? It is important to note that Korax's last words are a reference to the poem The Raven by the old Turanian writer Edgar Allan Poe and mean nevermore. In the source language of Corvus Korax pronounces nevermore, just as Raven does in the poem of the same name. It is known that Korax felt a heavy sense of guilt for his sons who died during the Horus heresy. It even got to the point of weakening the Primarch's ability to regenerate. An example of this would be an excerpt from The Lost Liberation. The wounds still ached, random jabs of sensation breaking through the defenses and jabs of the hypnotic state. Korax had to shift his weight to take the strain off his broken ribs, to ease the pressure on his damaged organs. The Primarch's artificially created body could withstand incredible damage, but there was something stronger than physical wounds. He forced himself to endure the pain to remember the defeat. He suffered the worst wounds that his superhuman body could not bear and the apothecaries could not heal. Until he could put an end to his mental agony, he would not let his body heal. And not only that, Korax also feels responsible for the failure of Project Rafter, which turned many Astartes into warped monsters. And the most likely reason for Korax's departure from his Legion and the Imperium is to seek redemption for his failures in the defense of Terra and the rebuilding of the Legion. So it could be said that the purpose of Korax's journey to the Eye of Terror is to hunt down his brothers who betrayed the Emperor, the survivors of the Horus Heresy, Lorgar, Angron, Magnus, Perturbo, Mortarian and Fulgrim, who have ascended to demon princes and rule over their own worlds in the Warp. And it is quite possible that Korax is still tracking down his brothers to punish them for all the crimes committed against their father and humanity. And what's more, Korax is known to not only hate, but despise his brothers for their treachery. And this is a feeling he has had 
since the moment of his battle with Conrad Kurse on Istvan V. It would seem that this is the most likely explanation for Korax's actions. However, we must take into account the events of the Shadow of the Past story. During his journey to the Eye of Terror, Korax arrived on the nameless moon where space marines from the Legion of the Word Bearers were building a temple dedicated to the Dark Gods. The Primarch of the Raven Guard began killing the traitorous Astartes one by one. The traitors mistook the Primarch for a demonic entity and began to make numerous sacrifices to protect themselves from the rage of the predatory spawn of the warp. In the end, Lorgar, Primarch of the Word Bearers, who had become the Demon Prince of Chaos Undivided, was forced to intervene. The traitor turned his gaze to the Swamp of Death and recognized the spawn not as a demon, but as his brother, and forced Korax to assume his true form, marveling at his brother's new abilities, including turning into a flock of ravens with burning eyes. And when Lorgar asked about his new talents, Korax answered him with the following phrase. I am what I have always been. I am vengeance incarnate. I am justice brought forth. This place beyond the shroud has revealed who we all truly are. Beneath the patina of humanity our father created for us. We are all by warp birth. I have sworn to eradicate the foulness of chaos from the galaxy, and you will be the first of the fallen brothers to die beneath my blades. A duel between the brothers ensued, during which the defeated Lorgar was forced to retreat through the warp portal to Sycorus. Based on this, it can be logically assumed that Korax is still hunting his fallen brothers across the warp to this day. But whether he is still alive is a matter worthy of debate. It's also interesting to see if the mission to kill his own brothers is some form of death oath. The death oath is a tradition of many of the Order of Astartes, and is often used as a punishment for certain crimes against the Order, where the offender must bring down the justice of the Emperor upon the enemies of humanity. The most notable example of the fulfilment of the Death Oath is Captain Uriel Ventris of the Fourth Company of the Ultramarines, who, in defiance of the Astartes Code, abandoned his company and led a Death Guard detachment to board a Tyranid ship. Korax was a notorious fatalist. For example, during the massacre in the landing zone, he was prepared to die at the hands of his brother Angron, clearly aware of the fact that he had little chance against the Primarch of the World Eaters. Thus, Korax's campaign could be either a death oath to atone for his failures to the Legion, or it could be simple revenge against his fallen brothers. And until Corvus Korax returns to the Imperium, if he returns at all, we cannot know his exact intentions. After the Horus heresy, when the legions of traitors were effectively wiped out, and the homeworlds of the betrayed Primarchs were either destroyed or purified before being given a new name and disappearing forever from all maps of the galaxy, Horus himself, oddly enough, became well known in the Imperium. Taking the name of the arch-traitor, he became the likeness of the embodiment of the evil of the ancient Terran religions for betraying his father in pursuit of his own selfish goals. However, the fact that Horus was under the rule of the Dark Gods is carefully hidden from the Imperial public. Somewhat surprisingly, another of the traitor Primarchs is still well known in the Imperium, and even more surprisingly, is still revered. This Primarch's name is Lorgar Aurelian, former Primarch of the 17th Legion. Currently, the Demon Prince of Chaos Undivided, Lorgar sought to elevate humanity through a deep belief in the Divine. But after the Emperor of Mankind rejected his worship, he discovered new gods worthy of his devotion. Those were the essences of the destructive forces of chaos. Lorga Aurelian, the Golden Sun, as he was known to many, the only one of his brothers whose favorite weapon was the direct power of devotion, was the Lord of the Legion of Word Bearers. In the dawn of his days, he stirred the world with the power of speech and the sheer force of charisma leading Colchis, his adopted homeland, through the flames of civil war to worship the Emperor whose coming he foresaw in dreams. Reunited with his father and placed at the head of the Legion of the Word Bearers, Lorgar enacted his conquests not only by strategy, overwhelming force or brute violence, but also by the fine arts of exaltation, liberation and example, inspiring his sons to feats of arms in the name of imperial truth and shocking the populations of entire planets with statesmanship and foresight. 
Under his rule, the Legion did not simply strike a planet into submission, leaving behind only scorched ruins, but used force of arms only as necessary to uplift and lead to freedom. Brutal destruction was left for the repeat offenders, the hopelessly depraved and damned. However, due to Lorgar's literal interpretation of the meaning of the Great Crusade, he and his Legion strayed from their appointed path. For his mistakes, Lorgar received nothing but scorn, disdain, and censure from his brothers and father. His greatest success, the temple city of monarchy, was turned to dust and ash by the emperor, who demanded a quick victory from his son, not worship. His father's actions shattered Lorgar's faith. Anger with resentment directed him down the road that was to lead to heresy, and the word-bearers began to secretly embrace new, darker truths, outwardly channeling their anger into a renewed circle of conquest that appeased the Emperor's suspicions. It was Lorgar and his legion, betrayed and betrayed, eager to spread their new faith across the galaxy that set the stage for the nightmare of heresy. However, despite the fact that the word-bearers were the first among the Legion to bow to pernicious forces, Lorgar himself is often mentioned in a positive way by the Imperials. For example, in Christian Dunn's book Pandorax, when Admiral Croswin and his crew fought against the Black Legion Marines. Did this traitor stand at Horus's side? Did he participate in the Battle of Terror, fighting creatures of legend such as Sanguinius, Lorgar and Russ? The manner in which the Primarch of the 17th Legion was mentioned suggests that both the Admiral himself and many in the Imperium, with the possible exception of the Inquisition and Adeptus Astartes, believe that Lorgar fought against Horus on the side of the Emperor. But what are the reasons for this mass delusion? Well, long before the heresy, Lorgar was putting great effort into creating and spreading the Imperial cult. Truly believing the Emperor to be a divine incarnation, Lorgar led his legion of word-bearers on a great crusade, intent on eliminating all threats to humanity and any heresy in the new Imperium. Ancient texts and icons were destroyed. He oversaw the creation of huge monuments and cathedrals that honoured his father. The greatest chaplains of the word-bearers carried out the work of carrying the Emperor's divinity and righteousness to the people, organising grand speeches and sermons. About this time, Lorgar wrote Lectitio Divinitatus, by means of which he proclaimed the worship of the Emperor as a divine beginning. And not surprisingly, those of the worlds that were brought to agreement by the forces of the 17th Legion accepted Lorgar's teachings and by erecting huge temples in the Emperor's honour and creating churches, helped spread the idea of Lectitio Divinitatus among the Imperial population. However, the Lord of Mankind was dissatisfied with the slow pace of the word-bearers' conquests and was even more wary of their religious zeal, since one of his main goals was to purify mankind from the ignorance of religion. The Emperor personally spoke to Lorgar, telling him that the task of the Space Marines was combat, not preaching, that he was a warrior, not a priest. The Emperor's firm stance in rejecting all faith was a hard revelation for the Primarch. It became for him the realization that his faith was a lie and that he himself was a deceiver. Indeed, his entire life's journey had been based on lies. Shocked by his father's words, Lorgar replied that he would fulfill his command within a month. Soon the Emperor was about to speak to him again, but he was informed that the word-bearers had returned to hostilities, and many worlds had fallen before their power. No more sermons about the God-Emperor were held. All copies of the Lectitio Divinitatus text were ordered destroyed. Lieutenant Commander, who had served in the Legion back in the days when they called themselves the Imperial Heralds, the name of the Legion from before the Primarch's reunion, had the following to say on the matter. The Primarch realized his mistake in time, but the punishment for it was too late. We are already humiliated in the eyes of the other legions by the insignificance of our conquests, and the need for punishment has only made us worse. Perhaps we should become Imperial Heralds again, purge ourselves of prejudice, and make the 17th Legion great again. Though most of Lorgar's writings were destroyed, many Imperials retained copies of Lectitio Divinitatus, and many secret imperial cults flourished throughout the Imperium, both during the Great Crusade and the Horus Heresy, forming the Temple of the Emperor Saviour. 
an organization that is the main church of the modern Imperium. And perhaps the reason for honoring Lorgar is precisely because the foundation of the entire Imperium cult is built on his book. Perhaps the Adeptus Ministorum deliberately chose to obscure the fact that Lorgar himself is a traitor by declaring him dead during the Horus heresy, ignoring the fact that the Primarch is not only alive but has risen to demon prince. In addition, unlike his brothers like Angron, Magnus, Fulgrim and Mortarion, who repeatedly led their traitorous Astartes armies into numerous battles on Imperial worlds, Lorgar only continues to grasp the mysteries of the Immaterium, having achieved his ultimate goal in demonic form. Which goes a long way towards keeping the lie in the minds of the Imperials that Lorgar was killed during the heresy. But could the spread of the Imperial cult have been planned by the Primarch from the beginning? And could Lorgar's long meditation be nothing more than part of some kind of ritual, something that requires all the demonic power of the 17th? Though most of Lorgar's writings were destroyed on his own orders, the Legion's first captain and part-time foster father of the Primarch, Kor Faron, kept a few copies with him. And when the Legion stepped into the service of Chaos, the Primarch may well have made a plan in case his brother's rebellion failed. And it was entirely possible that the words written by Lorgar might actually be an unimaginable form of manipulation to bolster the power of the ruinous forces. This could explain the reason for Lorgar's long meditation. He may well be in such a state in order to channel the emotions, fanaticism and prayers people have directed toward the Emperor into a sacrifice to the pernicious forces, or even to increase his own power in hopes of becoming equal to the gods himself. However, if true, this plan could only fully work until the 36th millennium, for after the overthrow of Goge Vandaya, the Mad Ecclesiarch, the Emperor's Servant Church was seriously reformed by Sebastian Thor and his Confederation of Light, and many of the tenets of Lectitio Divinitatis were discarded or changed which meant that those five millennia were too short to realize his plans, but also long enough to avoid his complete failure. Lemon Russ, also known as the Great Wolf and Wolf King, is the Primarch of the Sixth Legion of Astartes, the Space Wolves. Russ stood out from his brothers with his peculiar demeanor and aggressiveness, but was respected for his sense of honor, strength and fighting prowess. Russ was always very self-reliant and respected solely for personal fortitude. He was confident that he could easily handle most of his brothers in a duel, except for Sanguinius due to his skill with a blade and the warrior Horus. When the Primarch embryo capsules were scattered across the galaxy, Russ's capsule fell on a death world called Fenris. Unlike most of his brothers, the Wolf King had no adoptive parents. A Fenrisian she-wolf who accidentally found Russ's capsule raised the Primarch as if he were her own puppy. One day, local hunters stumbled upon a pack of Primarchs. They used arrows and spears to kill the adopted mother wolf. The Primarch fought with unprecedented fury. He killed a dozen warriors with his bare hands to protect his wolf brothers. When the hunters realized they were fighting a man, they lowered their weapons and took the warrior and the remnants of his pack to the local king. The one saw potential in the savage and accepted him into his tribe. Soon, the Primarch trained himself to be human. He learned the local dialect, learned to fight and win with the weapons of men. In just his third class, he defeated the local battle axe champion, disarming him. And soon that king gave the foundling his real name, Lehman of the Russ tribe. Lehman Russ became the best warrior of the tribe and took his place after king's death. Thus began the conquest of all of Fenris. The Primarch became famous as a great warrior, capable of single-handedly turning entire armies to flight. Soon, all the tribes felt the benefit of his strength and wisdom, uniting under the rule of the new Wolf King. The Emperor's spies discovered the missing Primarch, and soon the father traveled to meet his son. The Emperor concealed his identity, hiding behind a cloak and runes that hid his incredible psychic power. Even so, the wolves and the most sensitive of humans could sense his power. There was a noisy feast in the castle, but when the cloaked stranger entered the Wolf King's throne room, everyone fell silent. The Emperor offered the Great Wolf a contest, and if he won, all he wanted was a place at the right hand of the King at the festivities. The Primarch agreed, 
but demanded that if he lost, the stranger serve under him for a year. The emperor was infuriated by such an offer, but being confident in his abilities, he agreed. Lehman Russ did not want to stop eating, so the first test was a gluttony contest. The ruler of terror ate more than any of Russ's warriors, but when he looked up from his plate, he saw that in the same time, Lehman Russ had already eaten three bison, leaving only the bones. Victory remained with the Primarch. The next challenge was a drinking contest. Whoever could drink the most was the winner. But when the Emperor had finished the sixth barrel of hoppy honey, there was nothing more to drink. Lehman Russ had dried up all the supplies prepared for the feast. After the second loss, the Emperor became enraged. He called his son a glutton and a drunkard, unable to do anything else. There was not a single warrior or monster on Fenris capable of defeating the Wolf King. Everyone expected a swift massacre of the stranger, but he finally threw off his cloak and stood before them in all his majesty. Lehman Russ calmly drew his sword and proclaimed the third challenge, a fair fight. But this time, he lost. The Emperor broke the Primarch's fang with a single blow of his power gauntlet, and Lehman Russ fell unconscious. After an hour, the Wolf King recognized his defeat and swore allegiance to his father. Thus began a new phase of the Primarch's training, and after only a few weeks he had absorbed all the knowledge to skillfully command the Sixth Legion, renamed the Space Wolves. Lemon Rus donned power armor and armed himself with the legendary ice blade Mjalnar's teeth, forged from the teeth of the Kraken Gormenjarl. The Primarch of the Space Wolves became one of the most fierce and successful commanders. Despite his disregard for discipline, strategy and tactics, the Sixth Legion soon became one of the most powerful in the Imperium. The Primarch relied not on the training of his warriors, but on the innate skill of each. The Astartes under his command were taught to fight by relying on their senses more than anything else. From the outside, the Space Wolves battle looked like a band of barbarians but their Primarch didn't care. Lehman Russ led his warriors forward, always in the thick of the battle. And if anyone was unhappy with his methods, the Wolf King was always ready to defend his own with a blade. Once he even struck the Emperor in a similar situation. Such a fierce and explosive character created a certain fame for Lehman Russ. He was respected, but at the same time shunned as an unpredictable barbarian. Only Horus and Leo L. Johnson surpassed the Great Wolf in the number of victories. This depressed the Primarch, and he wanted to surpass his brothers in every way possible. During one of the joint assaults with the Dark Angels, Primarch Leo L. Johnson suddenly led his Marines in the flank of the Space Wolves. This led to some serious shits among the Fenrisians, which infuriated Lehman Russ. But the final straw was when Leo personally killed Tyrant, stealing the glory from the Great Wolf. A battle began which lasted for 24 hours, until Lemon Russ realized the comical nature of the situation. He stopped the fight and laughed, realizing that the Grand Primarchs were acting like boys. But Leo L. Johnson understood his brother's laughter differently. He considered it a mockery of him and struck his brother in a rage. Lehman Russ lay unconscious until the Dark Angels and their Primarch departed. After this event, a feud began between the Legions and every time they met, the Space Marines challenged each other to a fight, replaying the ancient Primarch duel even after 10,000 years. When Horus defected to the side of Chaos, one of the first Primarchs to know about it was Primarch Magnus the Red. Shortly before these events, the Edict of Nicaea had forbidden the use of sorcery in the Imperium. But Magnus thought this was unfair and decided to prove to the Emperor that sorcery could save the Imperium. He sent a message of betrayal to Horus, breaking through the defenses of the Palace of Terror with a mental message, resulting in disaster. The angry Emperor did not believe Magnus and suspected him of betrayal, and Lehman Russ was assigned to bring the Primarch to Terror. It should have been peaceful enough, but Horus couldn't let that happen. He convinced the Space Wolves Primarch that his father wanted the total destruction of Magnus, his legion of a thousand sons, and their homeworld of Prospero. Lehman Russ hated sorcery 
and had always been suspicious of Magnus the Red, so he easily succumbed to the provocation. Prospero was doomed, for he was attacked by a threefold combined force of Space Wolves, Sisters of Silence, and Imperial Army. As the Primarchs faced off in battle, Magnus reinforced himself with sorcery. He struck his brother's heart with his blow, but even the badly wounded Lemon Russ was able to win. He broke his brother's spine. In the last moments of his life, Magnus swore allegiance to Zinch, one of the Chaos Gods, and escaped into the warp. The enraged Wolf King sent some of his warriors in pursuit and travelled to Terra himself. The Sixth Legion did not participate in the battle for Terra. Primarch Russ arrived to see his father sitting on the Golden Throne. The Primarch went on a hunt, hunting traitors across the galaxy. But he soon had to return when Raboot Gilliman offered his Codex Astartes. The Great Wolf angrily rejected the offer to fragment his legion. He had raised his warriors as one indivisible pack and had no intention of changing anything the Imperium was on the brink of a new conflict. Robort understood perfectly well that he would not be able to convince his brother. Even the Emperor was powerless to impose his will on Lemon Russ. But the Primarch of the Space Wolves was unusually cunning for him. He officially announced the division of his Legion into Great Companies. In fact, nothing had changed. After all, the Legion's Great Companies had been quite autonomous before. But this helped to avoid escalating the conflict. Lehman Russ also created the Order of the Wolf Brothers. He hoped to eventually use the newly formed order to surround the Eye of Terror and keep an eye on the forces of chaos. The Great Wolf's plan failed as all the Astartes in the Order of the Wolf Brothers were struck with a terrible mutation and disbanded. However, the High Lords of Terror later implemented the plan with their own forces. 197 years after the Battle of Terror, Lehman Russ disappeared. During one of the feasts, he called for silence and prepared to make a speech. But then the Primarch was struck by a vision. He immediately gathered his veterans and left, leaving only the youngest of his retinue, Bjorn the Fell-Handed. For seven years, the Space Wolves waited for the return of their leader. Then the decision was made to appoint Bjorn as the new Great Wolf. The new leader proclaimed the first Great Hunt and set out in search of the Primarch. The Space Wolves travelled across the galaxy, performing feats, conquering worlds and destroying monsters, but they never found their father. Each new Great Hunt begins with a vision sent by Russ to the Rune Priests of the Space Wolves. The Order then sets out to accomplish the next great deed. Although the Wolf King has yet to be discovered, he has assured his pack that when the hour of the Wolf comes, he will return. But what really happened to the Primarch? Some say that Russ went in search of Leo L. Johnson, Primarch of the Dark Angels, and his rival. Before his disappearance, Russ received news of his brother's death in the Great Purge and could well have gone in search of the first without believing what he heard. Either way, even if that was the reason for Russ's disappearance, the Wolf King has completely failed in his mission, as Leo is quite alive and currently in a coma in the heart of the rock fortress of the Dark Angel Monastery. Another reason for Russ's journey to the Eye of Terror could be to hunt his traitorous brothers in order to avenge the dead Primarchs and his father's wounds. And this is one of the most likely options since, for example, Corvus Corax also travelled to the Eye of Terror for a similar purpose, as detailed in the story Shadow of the Past, where Corax tracked down and attempted to kill Argar. But while Korax decided to go on this mission alone, Russ took the Legion's best warriors with him. However, as plausible as this theory may sound, the Space Wolves themselves believe that the Primarch's mission is not to hunt down traitors, but to find artifacts and ways to restore the Emperor to his full life. According to the book, Russ's goal is to find some sort of tree of life, the seeds of which can supposedly cure anything and the Primarch seeks this tree with the goal of healing his father's wounds. Anyway, knowing the dangers of the warp, the fact that it is inhabited by an infinite number of demonic beings, and the fact that the laws of physics we are accustomed to have no meaning in the Immaterium, we can assume that Lehman Russ and his wars have disappeared or succumbed to madness. After all, despite the fact that the Primarchs look like human demigods against the background, and each of them possesses unimaginable power they can still be killed. 
and it is logical to assume that the Primarch of the Wolves fell while fighting an endless stream of unborn creatures in the depths of the warp. This is also indicated by the fact that most of the Legion relics found recently are nothing more than parts of their Primarch's gear. More on this can be found in the Codex of the Space Wolves, where during the second great hunt on the planet Rudra, which is on the very edge of the Eye of Terror, in a temple dedicated to Horus, the Wolves found a complete set of Russ's power armor. Though the Legion warriors questioned whether the armor belonged to the Wolf King, the set of armor that spread an aura of murderous cold around it looked too much like armor Elevagar, the Russ's battle armor, which is a unique power armor whose origins date back to a mysterious period of fierce wars. Within the armor's shell are generators of an unusual exothermic field, no longer known in the Imperium's arsenal of technology. When triggered, the generator siphons energy, especially heat and kinetic potential from the environment, creating an aura of deadly cold around the Primarch. This effect gave the armor its Fenrisian name, meaning wave of murderous cold. Based on the fact that the technology of production of exothermic field generators was lost to mankind before the Great Crusade, and Elevagar itself is a unique relic that has no analogues, we can assume that Lehman Russ was killed by the Chaos forces and his armor as a trophy was placed in the Temple of Horus. And if the Great Wolf is still alive, what could have caused him to abandon his armor? Well, perhaps the Primarch was aware of his own approaching death. When Lehman Russ had spoken to his sons shortly before his disappearance, he had emphasized that he was dying. Listen to me carefully, brothers. While I can still speak, there will come a hard time. Our legion will stand on the brink of death as I stand now, and our enemies will gather to destroy us. And then, my children, I will hear your call, and I will come, even if I have to break the laws of the universe to do so, and I will be with you. In the hour of the final battle, in the hour of the wolf. And if Russ knew he was dying, he might well decide to meet his death in battle, despising the very thought of waiting meekly for the end, like a sick, weak man. Russ had grown up on Fenris, in a world of endless battles and hardships. And like any man raised in a world of death, he had taken personal strength and fortitude above all other qualities. However, there are some inaccuracies and discrepancies between different sources regarding the Primarch's last words. In Chris Wright's audio drama, When the Paths Diverge, Russ, while giving the very same speech to his warriors, no longer mentions his death in any way. But at the same time, in the Space Wolves Codex, on the contrary, the Primarch declares it, almost in plain text. However, there is always the possibility that the Wolf King did not mean death in the literal sense of the word. It is necessary to remember about some peculiarities of the Sixth Legion gene seed, thanks to which space wolves have a heightened sense of smell and hearing even by the standards of Astartes, abnormally long fangs and yellow eyes. But therein lies the danger, for there is the possibility of far more extensive mutations that could turn a space wolf into a wild beast. This genetic defect is known as the Curse of the Wolfen, Subjects to this curse have a severely altered musculature system. This is followed by almost irreversible personality changes, turning the Emperor's Angel of Death into a mindless, bloodthirsty monster. Usually this side effect of the Gene Seedon is suppressed during the initiation of new fighters, but there are times when experienced warriors surrender to their curse, taking on the guise of a Wolfen. And while the Primarchs themselves are not usually susceptible to such Gene Seed defects, which usually manifest as a result of mutations after many generations of Astartes, another peculiarity of the Primarch's gene seed must be kept in mind. In the novel The Lost Liberation, a geniator mechanic examining pure samples of the Primarch's gene seed determined that sample number six, which is undoubtedly the sample obtained from Lemon Russ, is not purely human. We were able to identify at least six unique subcomplexes and protein branches aimed at enhancing physical endurance that are not present in the other samples. It is missing a portion of the enhanced genes. They appear to increase the vessel's architectonic structure responsible for the development of nociceptors and proprioceptive function. This flaw appears to be intentional. An entire set of cells in the genetic code of Object 6 
is taken from a source of non-human origin, possibly canine. In all, we were able to catalog 783 differences between the specimens that is common to all specimens of wing material, quintessential Primark material, for lack of a better term, extremely insignificant compared to what I expected to find. The presence of elements taken from the dog in Russ's DNA explains not only the boundless loyalty to his father, but also the fact that the Fenrisian she-wolf mistook the young Primark for a pup of his own species. It should also be taken into account that the genetic material of space wolves is one of the most unstable among the nine loyal legions and has a 75% chance of manifesting all sorts of mutations and abnormalities. On this trait, the Sixth Legion is surpassed only by the Salamanders, and the fact that the Primarch has abandoned his armor plays into the theory of the Wolf King's fall to the curse of Wolfen. After all, such a transformation would almost certainly make it physically impossible to wear a lavagar. And besides, it would also explain his sudden departure from Fenris and disappearance, as Lemon Russ might have felt that he could no longer resist the changes to his body and chose to meet his death in battle rather than turn into a mad beast. And the fact that he took the best warriors of the Legion with him is well explained by the fact that they were the few with a chance to kill the Great Wolf, in case he turned into a wolfin before he fell on the battlefield.